My name is Judy Keene. I am Director of Public Affairs for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I'd like to begin today by giving a brief overview of what the Bishop Delegation has done over the last two days, uh, the visits that they have undertaken. Yesterday, the Bishop Delegation visited Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley Humanitarian Respite Center. They also celebrated Mass here at the Shrine with members of the community, and this is the Shrine of the Basilica of Our Lady of San Juan. It is a national shrine. Today, the bishops spent their morning visiting the Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement Children's Center, the Southwest Casa Padre Center, where they spent time with the children and toured the facility. They later celebrated Mass with the children at the facility. In the afternoon, the bishops toured the Department of Homeland Security's Customs and Border Protection Processing Facility, and then they have now returned here where uh, they are happy to speak with you and answer your questions. And with that, I would like to introduce our press panel this morning. I will uh, begin by introducing His Eminence uh, in the center of the panel, Cardinal Daniel and Donardo, Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, and President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Seated next to him, to his right, is Archbishop Jose Gomez, Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He is Vice President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. To my immediate left is Bishop Daniel Flores. He is Bishop of the Diocese right here of Brownsville. And then on my far left, we have Bishop Joseph Charles Bambera of the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And then we are also joined by Bishop Robert J. Brennan, Auxiliary Bishop of the Diocese of Rockville Center, New York. And with that, I would like to invite the bishops to offer a few reflections of their visit this morning. And then immediately following that, we will open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Judy. I'm uh, happy as president to make a, a brief opening statement and I'm going to invite uh, Archbishop Gomez, who's been such a points person for us in, uh, in our immigration uh, issues over the last 18 months, that he'll make a brief statement, and then we'll be open uh, for questions. Uh, my first comment to you all is that, as it was already uh, spoken about and advertised, our visit was a pastoral visit, pastoral in nature. Um, so that has to be kept in mind as uh, you hear us uh, discuss or make comments on things. Uh, we uh, have had a, a full two days, and, and they've been uh, a very beautiful two days. On, on some parts, uh, painful, but very, very beautiful. Uh, we uh, almost sandwiched this with mass yesterday morning at the Basilica. By the way, as a plug, this is the second most visited pilgrim shrine in the United States. The only thing maybe a little bigger is the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. So this is a huge place of pilgrimage. We were very pleased to celebrate there and very pleased uh, to celebrate the Casa Padre uh, late this morning. So the prayerful pastoral dimension of what we want to do is uh, pretty significant. Secondly, the hospitality of uh, the Diocese of Brownsville with um, uh, Bishop Daniel Flores, Bishop Avi Les, and their whole crew. And I, I, I have to say, uh, Sister Norma, too, who's the Director of Catholic Charities for the, the Valley down here, they have been of great, great help and of intense knowledge uh, to help us as we went about doing our visits. So one of the things I want to make in my brief statement is that there are lots of challenges here. Uh, there's lots of things we found that we could make a recommendation or, 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 or other. But what we want to emphasize after we've had uh, our meetings is that there are no villains. We have received incredible cooperation to every site that we went to. Whether we're dealing with the Department of uh, Homeland Security or whether we're dealing with uh, uh, border protection, uh, whether we're dealing today with the uh, Casa Padre, all of the people who are involved in this were, uh, were incredibly helpful. Uh, I, I want to make sure everyone knows that. Uh, 
May I also add in this that um, when you have uh, gratitude, there is maybe something that comes forward, though, that you really want to say. And I said this a few weeks ago, and after our two days here, I want to say it again, that the, the children who were separated from their families, their parents, need to be reunited. That's already begun, and it's begun, and we're, we're pleased with that, but it's certainly not finished yet. And there may be complications, but it must be done, and it's urgent. That would be the one thing uh, I would take away from this. And uh, Archbishop Gomez, my three minutes are up. You go ahead and you make a statement. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I just want to say that for me, uh, it was very special today to uh, uh, be the main celebrant of the mass that we had at Casa Padre. I can celebrate with my brother bishops, and it was just a, a beautiful moment of prayer. And I think the, uh, we were about uh, 250 uh, children there. So it was a, a special moment in our visit because that was uh, the, the mission that we had to have a pastoral visit. And I was interested to, to see that the children participated actively. And um, uh, so uh, at the same time, it was, as you can imagine, challenging to see the children by themselves. Uh, uh, obviously, in every Sunday when we have children at mass, they are with their parents, uh, with their families. So, um, but it was, as I said, a blessing, a special blessing to be there and help them and, and give them some hope. Uh, we talk about it uh, uh, during the celebration of mass of how uh, the presence of God and how important it was for them to help each other in this challenging situation. And as Cardinal Leonardo said, the first reflection that I had personally as been there was the, the urgency of the reunification of the families. I think it is so important that these children be united with their parents. Uh, um, it's just a, a, a natural uh, feeling and, and understanding of, of uh, how sad it is that they are not with their parents and how important it is that as we are all are trying to do, make sure that they, they, they are united with their families. So that's basically my first uh, uh, impression of what uh, I experienced today. Um, now it's time, we, as they say, it's open. Oh, wait a minute, Archbishop has another comment. Excuse me, I'm, I'm getting forgetful. Uh, another thing that I think was good for me that uh, it was the, on that, process of uh, 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 providing unity for the families. I think it's important because it was, it was striking to me to see Sister Norma and to see everything that Catholic Charities of Rio Grande Valley has done and all what the USCCB is trying to do in the whole country to really help in that process of uh, reunification to make sure that we are there as we were here today to be with the, the children and their parents and to participate as much as possible in helping those families to be united. Thank you. Thanks, Archbishop Gomez. Now what we're going to do is open it up for questions and uh, you can direct your question to, uh, to any one of us um, and you might want to distribute the question so no one's lonely up front here. <laughs> so that was so, and somebody will be coming around with a microphone too so that we can hear your questions as well. So, and then again, state your name and the news organization you are with as well and to whom you are addressing your question. Thank you. We'll begin with our first question. Hi there, thank you so much. I'm um, Oscar Margain with Kent's Five San Antonio. I'm based here in the Valley. My question to the Cardinal and the rest of the, the Archbishop and the Bishops, how would you um, address somebody who's trying to reconcile, doesn't know how to reconcile their, their conservative views on faith with their conservative views on politics? Because so much of that, I think, is, is causing uh, maybe some internal turmoil for those who follow the Catholic Church. How would you approach them? What would you say? Well, I'll make a, an effort at it and then ask one of the other brothers if they want to add. Uh, our faith is a, a, a not just a, um, a system of concepts. Uh, our faith is in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Now, our church has teaching. 
It has approaches to the human person, and by the way, human person is pretty critical. Um, let me give you an example. Yesterday, I met family, and we were at uh, sister's place uh, yesterday, and this, this fellow said to me, you know, he was coming out of uh, Honduras, and his point to me, he says, you know, you know, I'm a Catholic. He said, I, I can't live in violence. They, they threatened to kill me. Well, and he had his son with him and all. Um, did he cross, I mean, obviously, he, he crossed uh, the border. Is, uh, that part is illegal. But I'm not, I'm not looking at an abstraction when I look at him. I'm looking at a human being. And this human person, I mean, it is shaken. I can't just say to him, well, you know, this is this and this is that. Yes, uh, uh, there are borders. Our nation has rights. There's no question. We also have to keep in mind a humane approach to these things. So I would tell the conservative in their faith and their politics, uh, the two can be lived together. There may occasionally be tension, but maybe uh, we all need to uh, cool our rhetoric and uh, approach one another that these are human beings here. And by the way, the person who's very concerned all, they're a human being too. So we have to use both sides. I, persuasion to my mind and real genuine persuasion, not tactics of, of um, compulsion. That's, in my mind, a, a, an answer for people. Uh, I have uh, plenty of people in my local church who are very traditional in faith and uh, very uh, conservative even politically, but who are moved uh, by the sight of the immigrant children. So, I mean, I know that it's possible. I, I should not be, anybody want to try this? You want to try that. That's really good. You should have Scranton try. Thank you. I would simply pick up on the Cardinal's perspective. Uh, when you have the opportunity to sit down with a family. Uh, liberal labels and conservative labels melt away. And when you talk to somebody whose deepest desire is not to exploit a country or grab everything that they can, but simply provide for their children uh, and to keep their children safe, uh, the labels just melt away. And I think we come to understand what's most important and frankly, why we were here. Anybody else? Okay. As they say, next question. <laughs> Hi, I'm used to just yelling them out. So I have three of them. I'm gonna just try to, so you don't have to go back and forth with the microphone. My name is Melissa, I'm with KHOU out of Houston, Cardinal. Donardo, you know we're gonna wanna hear from you. The first question is, we were at the Basilica today and at five o'clock ran this story with a Catholic woman named Bertha who is legit praying for a miracle. She believes in miracles, she thinks it's gonna be a miracle that Congress can come to a resolution. A lot of Catholics that we talk to are saying they're praying that there can be some sort of bipartisanship solution. If you're going back to your diocese, is praying enough? Is there anything else that Catholics can do after seeing what you saw? Okay. Uh, first of all, I believe in miracles too, and I'm delighted that Bertha is there. And, and I'm glad that she's praying, and I certainly think that praying is more sufficient than people even imagine for in situations that look, as the Italians in my culture like to say, that they're, um, uh, the tessuto is pasticcio, which just means like pasta. It's all glued together, and it can become unglued. Uh, and prayer is important. But in addition to prayer, I, I, I take up your um, supposition of your question. Beyond what happens relative to uh, H, uh, DH, HSS, I'm all confused with these, uh, these names, nomenclature. But, um, you know, we have to petition Congress. We have to talk to them. And we have to make it really intense, not nasty, but really intense. These issues have to be solved. And you know, they, whatever it may be, you know, people upset either with the administration or this or that, the, the place where this happens is Congress. And, and my hope would be to write, call, do anything 
to include Congress to work a, uh, what will probably have to be uh, some compromises, but a, a, um, an integral uh, immigration reform. So that's how I'd answer that one. Does anybody have a further comment on that? Okay. And he knows everything, so if he says it was okay, then it's okay. Because my next question goes a little bit on your street cred. I think faith leaders across the country have some legitimacy when it even comes into kind of dipping your feet into politics. Politicians, how could you deny a spiritual leader your ear? So with that being said, if you're petitioning folks across the country to reach out to Congress, will you? I, I can honestly say we have. But somebody else, Archbishop, you want to make a comment? Thank you, Cardinal. Um, we are, we, we, I mean, we have a, uh, uh, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, we have the Immigration and Refugee Services, and uh, we are always working on trying to explain to everybody, uh, Catholics first, and then everybody else, including our uh, elected officials, about the importance of this issue. Uh, and I think it's not, it's not just a matter of uh, politics, it's a matter of humanity. So I think, uh, I think all of us are always trying to help everybody in our country to understand that the immigration issue is not just politics. It's really talking about uh, men and women, parents and, and, and children, brothers and sisters. That's what it is. And, and it's, a, it's a global reality. So I think, I think uh, they shouldn't see us just as you know, religious leaders. We all are participate in the same humanity, and we are together trying to find the solution to this situation. This next question is for Bishop Flores, because for the last four years, the Respite Center has been open at Sacred Heart Church. And one of the fascinating things about the Catholic faith around the world is it's everywhere, especially in Central America and Mexico. Has there been a message at all to churches where these people are fleeing their countries in mass as to maybe the dangers of the journey, what it's like? Is there a responsibility for the Catholic Church to maybe warn people of just how deadly it can be? Should they assume to migrate to the United States? Uh, thank you, that's a very good question. In fact, there is a very frequent communication between the bishops uh, the United States and Mexico and Central America on a, on a variety of topics, and I can certainly speak for the bishops of the of the border that we do that we do kind of try to communicate that, and 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 there is a, a consistent sort of trying to kind of attend to the to the push factors that are affecting especially Central America as, and and the bishops there and here. Uh, I think uh, the message does get through how dangerous it is, but but I think the other side of it is we have to realize that we have we have and I've spoken to mothers in Guatemala or in Honduras who have told me, um, my son will be killed here. They will shoot him. And he's 16. What am I supposed to do? Now these are extremely complex and difficult situations. And obviously I think one of the things the church in the Western Hemisphere has a responsibility to do, and we do do it, and, and need to continuously do it is to kind of is to kind of raise the, sort of the reality. That this is a hemispheric problem. It's not just a problem on the border here, and it's not just a problem increasingly uh, that Mexico is becoming a point of destination, which it is for Central Americans. But that the, that 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 part of the dialogue that this sort of represents, th this kind of talking to the immigrants and so forth, to kind of regain and to maintain the realism about what is moving people. Is to, is to we get a sense that many people would much prefer to stay home if they if they didn't feel that their children's lives were at stake, and that and that we and that communication especially to kind of help because there are church programs in Central America that are trying to revitalize neighborhoods and trying to give and we hear about that and there are success stories, and that and that that, that needs to be part of the wider conversation, um, because. <clears throat> to kind of address the, the very push factors. And so it, it actually does address your question about there is more than prayer. Prayer moves, prayer motivates all of this in a certain way in the life of the church, but also that this kind of communication. But, but I, don't, I, I often don't think that we have gotten the message out how dire it is in certain parts of Central America in terms of families that hear their children telling them, the gang wants me and if I don't go, they're gonna shoot me. And, 
and that wider conversation to kind of address the hemispheric reality is part of also our responsibility as a church and as a nation. Thanks. I would, you know, add to that that we discuss a little this afternoon how bringing stability to these nations in Central America, stability in terms of economy, helps mm -hmm. people not have to worry about fleeing and immigrating. It's, it's an important dimension. Again, it's a complex problem, you know, you don't solve this with a, overnight, but there are a whole series of issues that are involved in this. And I've become aware in the last two days, I was aware before, but it was more <laughs> conceptual and abstract when you get names and people and all and talk to people on all sides, you, you realize this really is a, a pretty complex issue. We have time for a few more questions. Let's get some other folks here that we haven't gotten yet. Yes, sir, in the front. Specifically with regard to the um, condition of the children, those children that you have met, have they been happy, sad, scared? Tell us what you've seen with regard to their mental, physical state. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a brief intervention, then give it to, to Bishop Brennan. Uh, yesterday, I met a, a couple of children uh, that were over at uh, Sister Norma's place, and they had been there already a day and were ready, probably eventually get on the bus with their family. And they were a little more at ease. They seemed, you know, that whatever has happened to them, they knew they were going to go someplace, so that's a, that's a hopeful sign. Uh, I must confess, and some of the young people I saw this morning seemed a little more tense. There could be lots of reasons. You know, I mean, I, you could be frivolous, you know, Mexico and Brazil, you know, we're playing or something. But it could be something much more intense, you know, that's happened to them. So it's been a wide variety of reactions. Some of the adults I talked to yesterday were uh, what I'd call quietly uh, anxious. What age are the youngest of the children you saw? The one who's 14. No, I didn't see him. That I talked to. That I talked to. Yes, I think the, the ages range in, in the groups that we had seen from about 11 or 10 or 11 until 17. Um, and His Eminence is correct. There was a very different sense of people in the different places. And when we started off with the respite center with Sister Norma, there was a sense among everyone adults and children of, of relief, and I kind of picked up a sense of hope. Um, my conversations seem to pick up when you talked about the future. When you talked about the past, when the, the journey, um, the experiences along the way, it was a little bit more reticent, but when you talked about where you were going, or the family who you were going to see, or some of just the normal things in life, um, people both young and old really seemed to light up. That was incredibly inspiring. And again, at Sister Norma's, um, at the respite center, you know, among the youngest of children, there we did see very young children with their parents, I mean, infants. And there's the corner with the toys, and children are children. And when they got together with their toys, you saw children at play. It was a very edifying piece. Today, um, we were noting during Mass, the young people were hanging on to Archbishop Gomez's words during his homily. And yet there was a sense of, of real seriousness, a, 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 a stoic, somber kind of a, of a look. It was very clear that they were well cared for, that the people who were working with them treated them well. It, but it's also you're looking at children without their families. And that in itself is just a painful thing to see. Um, many of them were unaccompanied minors. I think the large majority of the people in the facility at Casa Padre were um, there as, as, as unaccompanied minors. I'm sure that it's the first time people had a s chance to, to sit down and think about what had happened along the journey. You know, over the last couple of weeks and months, Every night was about survival. <laughs> and so there was a sense almost of re relief even there, but not really more wonderment, more, okay, what happens now? It's the first chance to reflect on what happens now. There was a real, real seriousness. Um, 
at the detention center there wasn't the same opportunity just because of privacy and human dignity for the interaction for the contact but just from what we could observe um, the the people who work there uh, the custom the agents the border agents themselves are parents and they spoke to us as parents and they talked about they spoke from the heart and I think they saw themselves there just trying to serve and care for these young children and the whole families. Again, we are really pushing to see the families who are, were separated, reunited, but um, there was a real sense of care for the young people there. But again, it was strangers in a strange place. This was all just, just very, very odd. Um, and yet, I think they still bear the burdens of the journeys that they had trodden already. That, that was incredibly clear. The one uplift, as, as Eminence said, there was a great deal of interest in Brazil in the Copa Mundial. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Uh, we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. So, gentleman in a light blue shirt. Hi, I'm Daniel Tix. I'm a freelancer working with the Washington Post. Uh, Cardinal Donato, you spoke about the role of Congress, but family separation obviously was an issue, you know, policy that was put forth by the Trump administration. Can you talk about after having been here, having ministered to the children, found out the facts on the ground, do you have a specific message you want to send to the administration? Are there particular policy goals and what leverage might you have as bishops to affect change? Mm -hmm. I don't know about our leverage. Um, I'm glad this uh, executive order came that you should bring the children back together with their parents, particularly when they came with parents. That's really important. It's not totally done yet. It's got to be done. Um, one of our concerns would be, what would happen if you had a, a family separation okay, you got separation over with, and then it ended up in family detention? And we have some concerns about family detention. And one of our thoughts, and, and it's, I can't say it's the whole conference, but we've been talking about it here. Um, we've been asking questions. In the past, there was an alternative, I'm reading it here, alternative to detention called family case management programs. They have been used. Actually, they're cost effective, and because it's case management, we would be happy to say, you know, not because it's only our Catholic charities or other private, both religious and non-religious uh, uh, groups that do this kind of thing, case management. We think this would be a, again, we, we proffered it because we don't want to give, give examples, give uh, advice, and, and not say we want to be a part of it. We, we would be help. We want to be of help in all this. So that's one of the things we've been uh, uh, toying around with here, even during our days here, that we think that case management system would be very good to help keep the families, you know, they won't be separate anymore, but we don't think they should be in detention. It's, it's, we don't think that's the best thing. Now, they need to be accounted for. We're not opposed to any of that. Uh, in fact, some people we saw yesterday were gonna get on their bus. Didn't they have the ankle bracelets on or something? So they have some accountability. But they're able to, to live with a little more, I call it hope, and I, again, I'm not making a blanket statement here, but when you go through this kind of thing, whether you're family or whether you're an undocument, uh, unaccompanied minor, there's an element of, um, of real trauma that happens to you. There really is, and you can see it when you talk to some of the, the kids. Now, this doesn't mean anyone's trying to intensely give them trauma on this part of the border, I, I think if there were people on the other side who were trying to, you know, make money off of them on their way up, sure, certainly. But some of these people, whether adults or children, have been traumatized. It strikes me that the family case management working with them, remembering they're, they're undocumented, but also working with them to, gives them some chance to breathe uh, and some hope. At least three of the adults I talked to yesterday said, they, they were happy to be here, and they did really want to work. Now, that's anecdotal, right? Some people can say all that is is anecdotes, right? But when you have anecdotes, you've got people that they're sacrificing a lot just to get here. So that would be my thought. I don't know anybody else. Archbishop, you may have something to add. No, no, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, that was very good. <laughs> Thank you. No, I would just... Uh, uh, say the same thing that uh, I think we, we want something from the administration and from Congress is family unity because that's essential for the human person. So, whatever it takes, 
and and we are obviously willing to help and do whatever whatever we can in order to make it happen. But I mean, we all understand that. I mean, there's nothing most most important for us or most beautiful that our families. The way they came here, or this, the the, we can do it. You know, address the legal requirements of our uh, of our country to make the decisions that are correct, but with family unity. I suppose, in one sense, we'd say we would. We, we, we would propose something like that. I actually think, you have to forgive my lack of memory here. It's old age setting in. I think we've already proposed something like that, already. But I'd have to check it to make sure then. But we would propose something along those lines. We think it's a good, it's, it's, um, it's a fair, it's an efficient, effective. It's also not as expensive as doing full family detention. So uh, to my mind, we are a nation of laws. We are also a nation of compassion. We, from our trip, there are no villains, but there's lots of challenges and there's some things we can do better. That's basically what we wanted to say in this because otherwise we'd lose our pastoral glands and, and we'd become just a, another, um, another cipher. We, we'd prefer to be, yes, there are many good things. People are really working hard, whether they're on the, the Border Patrol or whatever. And, and yes, the, the Catholic Charities here is doing well, and yes, that's happening all over the country. And yes, people do want to come here, and some of them are traumatized, and yes, we've got to get children back with their parents. It's really crucial. Okay, one more final question, and then I think we're going to wrap up. So, gentleman here in the white shirt. Uh, your Eminence, I was thinking about this question before you, you answered the last one. Uh, we have heard about the moral imperative of this crisis. There is a moral component to it. We, we, we should be compassionate. And there is a legal component to it. We are a country of laws. But I think there is an arithmetic component to it. N not everybody can come here, right? So from a Christian point of view, from a moral point of view, uh, what is the limit? I remember that Jesus Christ answered this question saying 70 times 7. But what I mean is, for how long we are compassionate when we say there, there, we don't have a space for more people? Uh, is, isn't that a question too? It certainly is a question. Thank you for it. Um, every nation has a uh, has borders. Uh, we in our faith uh, respect the borders, even of our nation. We, what I think we have right now is a broken immigration system. Uh, if you have a, um, a relatively intact and robust immigration system, yes, there will still be people that may not be able to come in. But the whole manner in which you go about this will be far more of integrity. And uh, you do want to get people who are coming in to do us harm, right? Hasn't that been those more of a, a traditional conservative position are so worried that uh, the borders are too porous. I think what we need is that we need borders, but our laws and compassion can work together. They do not have to be absolutely opposed. But we're not opposed that there would be Congress to do a much better integrated uh, immigration system. Uh, anybody else want to say something on this? Archbishop wants to say something. He knows about this. Uh, you know, I, I think talking about numbers is impossible. I don't know who can even say this number or that number. But I think what, what uh, our, uh, we, are, uh, we all need to understand, uh, and our government, and our, uh, the administration, and the elected officials, officials, is that it's possible to address the, the, the uh, needs of the immigration reform. It's possible to do it. And uh, you just need uh, the, the make the decision that we can do it. And, and, and I think once that we do that and understand uh, and have everybody working together, you know, Congress and the administration and the different agencies and, and all of us, we can find a solution. Then it will be much easier to that our borders be protected and, and, and the people that are already here become very productive. Our country is a country of immigrants. 
uh, it's a great country, it's the American dream, but we need to understand that there is a reality now that is immigration, that people are moving all over the world, and we can, we need to find the, uh, the best way to address that specific problem. I was thinking this morning, uh, when I was, uh, uh, when I saw the children, what what any parent will think of these children? You know, it's, you know, it takes to your heart. Because nobody wants to see their kids in that situation. We understand that for these parents to come all the way here, then we understand, hey, we need to find a solution for this immigration reality, and we can do it. And then uh, uh, we, we are really the leaders of the world, helping the whole world to understand that there are ways to move people around and respect the borders and the, uh, the, the laws of every country. Uh, one more thing that was really good was uh, talking to the, ki to the kids about, about, as the Cardinal was saying, about uh, the World Cup. When I uh, asked them to pray for Mexico to win, they said, no, Brazil. <laughs> so. Pope Francis has invited us all on a journey with the migrant, the refugee, and um, we're, a, we're a part of us in our faith, and um, we're glad we're, a, we're part of the trip and the journey. This is one small little step. Um, we're so gracious, our grati gratitude here for uh, Brownsville and the Diocese and the people here. We're, we're grateful to you uh, for coming today. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence and Your Excellencies, and thank all of you for coming to today as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.